Hi, Tony. Hope you're well there in Sydney. Uh, I'm in spanking good form, Marty. How are you? Uh, uh, not quite as good as that, but I can never hope to be. I live in Ohio, and I'm going to keep cracking those Ohio jokes till I get enough emails to tell me to stop. Um, but I love, I love where I live. It's where God has allotted my boundaries, and uh, very proud Ohioan. So, um, yeah. So you know, I, you don't know this, but I'm going to tell you that uh, we had an apprentice start at the church where I serve and I oversee, similar to you and quite different, but similar that oversee apprentice training, uh, guys yeah. going into ministry or thinking about ministry. You know, that's something you've more started more formally um, to do. Well, it was interesting when I laid out the first day, one of the hopes and expectations of uh, the apprenticeship, the guy said, listen, I come from a church that sermons are 60 minutes. And I just feel that I, I don't know how to preach shorter because that's what all I've learned. And so I, I need to learn how to preach shorter. And, and so a couple of things come from that. I just get your opinion on um, it, it here in the U S at least, if someone says we should preach shorter, the, the reaction is you're a sellout <laughs> that you don't value the ministry of the word um, yeah. that you obviously don't care about the Lord and that, yes, you should not preach in shorter sermons, but longer sermons. Um, and before I get you to react to that, let me just say one of the most helpful things you've written for me is years and years ago in a briefing article, you wrote a, a, something like an editor's guide to sermons. Hmm. Um, and that's what got me thinking about this whole topic. So maybe I'll just first go back to wh what's your reaction when someone says I should be preaching shorter sermons? Do you think they're a sellout? <laughs> well, well, the person who says that that it is a sellout, that sermons should be 60 minutes. I mean, the obvious question is why only 60 minutes on that logic? Right. I mean, why not two hours? Yeah. And if you say, oh, okay, two hours, why not three hours? <laughs> um, and and you, in, in that sense, it's a, you, you would never win that game. You, you could always be called a sellout because you're not willing to preach a 13 hour sermon um, and you don't value the word. Um, and when you ask, well, what? That's ridiculous, obviously. Why is it ridiculous? It's ridiculous because obviously there's diminishing returns. Why are there diminishing returns? Why would a 13 hour sermon not be a good idea? Um, and when you tease out why it wouldn't be a good idea, it's because of the doctrine of creation. It's because we are certain kinds, we are made as certain kinds of people with certain kinds of capacities that are part of who we are as creatures. Um, as creatures, we find it almost impossible to stand and talk for 13, for 13 hours. Fidel Castro apparently could, but, but apart from <laughs> a few other people like that, we, we, um, we just can't do that as speakers, nor can we do that as listeners. It's not because of a commitment to the word or lack of commitment to the word. It's our capacities as humans and the way communication works as creatures, as we speak to each other. And that's a given. It's a creational given. It's not evil. It's not, it's good. It's the way we are. Um, and so the question of sermon length, um, is, a, is partly a question of our creational human capacities and the nature of human communication. And that's why it's so difficult to come up with a sermon length that is the right sermon length, because in different contexts and in different, in different um, both the circumstance you find yourself in and the kind of person you are and the kind of person that your congregation, people your congregation are, there will probably be a, an approximate length of sermon that is the best fit for the kind of preachers you are, that God has made you in your context. What I mean by that is I, I know some preachers who can carry off a 60-minute sermon um, really well. It's compelling. It's, uh, they, they carry you right through with you. They achieve what the sermon is meant to achieve, which is to bring the congregation to the word and to steep them in that word and to apply that word to their lives. They, they carry the congregation with them over that time uh, and they have the capacities just as a speaker, the gifts that God has given them and that they've developed um, in order to do that. I've seen other guys try to do that and they don't have that capacity just personally. They don't have the gifts to speak interestingly and compellingly from the passage for an hour and the result is actually counterproductive. Um, people are turning off. People are very committed, very much wanting to hear the word it's not a lack of commitment on their part but the creational gifts of the speaker are such the gifts that god has given them in themselves and that they've developed aren't such as to be able to communicate in that mode 
And mm. um, I, th I think in the answer to your apprentice, I think it's an excellent idea to learn to preach lots of different length sermons um, because different contexts will require them from you. Um, but also to find the length of sermon that you can give, given the kind of person and the gifts you have, the kind of communication abilities that God has given you, and how you can maximize and optimize those gifts to, to communicate God's word, to, to explain and expound and preach God's word to people uh, as compellingly as, as you can. So um, there are some guys who should not preach for longer than 30 minutes. They really shouldn't, uh, because after 30 minutes, it's. Um, it starts to you start to get diminishing returns. You lose the congregation, and it can become counterproductive. But what there are other guys. Eight minutes, should... like me. <laughs> well, we're trying to get you up to ten. My goal is to get <laughs> you to fifteen, Marty, and I, I think I can get even you to fifteen. <laughs> well, okay. So you you say that that's a good point. So maybe just to summarize, I think um, to use a different way in uh, our book that we came out with at Matthias Media years ago called Saving Eutychus, really good yeah. book. And yeah, yeah. I mean, it's universally appreciated. The only feedback negative about the book, well, someone didn't like the title. They thought it was, a, but I love the title. I think it's great. But uh, uh, the only substantive feedback negatively is the book seems to be advocating shorter sermons. But I remember asking Phil Camel, one of the co-authors of the book, he said, no, I actually didn't do that. I said, um, I'm advocating to preach as long as your people are able to listen. And that's different than advocating shorter sermons. And yes, so as long as I, people as long as people are able to listen to you, yeah, the kind of yeah, the kind right. of person that yeah. the kind of abilities you have to construct and carry off that kind of teaching. Yeah. So, yeah. so one aspect we'd say: find a trusted friend. Often, your spouse can be very good at this, but yeah. also find a few other trusted friends who not only listen on their behalf, because often you'll find the more mature Christians who are able to listen at the longer end uh, or at the the, the the longer side of the spectrum but ask them to listen on behalf of the person they're bringing to church for the first time or the person who's just been a new Christian or new Christian for a year and try to vet it through those different lenses, so to speak. Um, so I think finding someone who will tell you the truth, a number of people, and you can get some good feedback that way. So that's leaving that aside, because I think that's a whole nother conversation. As an editor, you can at least help us reframe the question to say, not just, oh, preach shorter or longer, but make every word count. And that's really important in writing as it's important in speaking. So yeah. as an editor, give us some uh, guide points on not just preaching, but giving talks, being in public with a presentation. Um, what's, what's some helpful things you could pass on? Um, it, it has been, I have to say, it's been something of an occupational hazard for me um, to have worked as a writer and editor um, and to have sat and listened to so many sermons over the years in church and loved listening to sermons. But a slight occupational hazard is I find it very hard not, not to get out of editor mode. And I've got to make sure I'm not doing that when I, when I listen to sermons because a, a piece of writing and a sermon are, are, are very similar in that they're both attempting to communicate a message and they do it in the same kind of way um, to engage and, and intrigue the listener at the beginning to get, get the listener or reader on board to then lay out and inform and explain and teach the points that you're wanting to make, the argument you're wishing to make, that lands somewhere that makes a difference, that, that means something personally. And uh, nearly every form of writing is like that. Nearly every form of written, yeah. written communication is like that as well. So w one thing that I, I notice as an editor when I'm, when I'm editing a piece of work is I look for that sort of structure roughly or something that, that, that achieves that. Um, and um, as I listen to sermons, I sometimes think if I was editing this sermon as an editor, I would say you didn't, you didn't very often, you didn't do enough at the beginning to, to draw your, to take your listeners with you on this journey you're about to go on, on this, on this through line you're about to go on. There wasn't, there wasn't, you didn't figure out what the sharp kind of tension point was of this passage. What, what really important or difficult or challenging issue it was raising and helping your congregation to feel the weight of that issue at the beginning so that they want to see how this passage addresses it. So um, a lot of sermons I listened to, you could tell that the preacher had done a lot of work on what the argument and nature of the passage was and, and what the essential content was 
it had run out of time um, in preparation to really land the first part and the third part. That is, how am I going to compellingly and not don't take too long on it about it because you don't want a, a 35 minute introduction. Um, but how can I draw my people into this issue and, and help them feel the weight of what we're about to look at? Take them on that on the train trip and then land them at the other end and somewhere that answers that. And yeah. um, the the uh, one of the things I said in that article was that when you're looking at a, an article or any kind of written piece of work, it always needs a couple of drafts. Uh, you always need to put all the information down, get it all out there and get it down and then put it aside for a couple of days and come back to it and say, oh, I see, it's, <laughs> it's a real mess. You know, <laughs> there is, that introduction is lame. It doesn't actually land. What I promised in the introduction is not where I landed at the end and the in-between parts don't all kind of fit together. You need to, to come back. And so uh, I remember one of the things I said in that article was that certainly whenever I preach and as I talk to other preachers, if there's a chance to have a first draft, gap second draft if you can come back to your sermon after you've done the first pass through it and make sure that it has that structure uh, and give it a second run through give it a second pass that's that's often very useful yeah so it's just it's discipline it's saying i'm going to prepare in enough time to allow that to happen i mean so many of the long sermons i've heard and the ones i've given that are too long it's just I, I realize there's no tightness, or as my one friend says, you know, has it baked enough? It's underbaked, mm. and that mm. takes mm. time. That gap, as you're talking about, yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you, you, that's typically the case. To, to, for for it to be tight and to communicate really well, and then some people, as you, you get better at this over time. And yeah. I'm sure, as the more experience, the more experiences a preacher you become, the more you can see first time through what I need to do, and and you get better and quicker at doing it. But the idea that I, I need to make sure it has that kind of trajectory as a piece of communication and that I've worked enough on it and over it enough to give it that tightness. Um, I think it's the same in both forms of communication, whether it's written or spoken in, in that sense. Yeah. Would you say um, one of the things I, I find helpful is coming up the old theme and aim. Um, I remember mm. a young girl works with us here at Matthias Media. She was asked to give a talk, a, a 20 minute talk in front of the MOPS group, the mother's group that meets at our church. And it's the natural thing when someone has to first give a public kind of monologue uh, is I don't, I'm never, 20 minutes is so long. And I told her, I said, listen, after you get thoughts down on paper, you're going to be on the other side of it. And she came back and she said, yep, my talk's about 45 minutes <laughs> long. And so yeah. I gave her the idea that if you just have one theme and one aim or a theme that drives the one aim, that will really help pare down all the other really good things you want to say. Because, of course, yeah. we can say a lot of good things, but is this the helpful through line, as you said um, really helpfully a minute ago? Is this add or reinforce the through line or is it a helpful uh, different line? And so that's always been really helpful, simple piece of advice that I, it's helped me. It's certainly the case in writing, as in as in preaching. I think that having worked out what is the trajectory, what is the the trip you want, a train trip you want to take people on, and which in a sense narrows it down to what is the station I want everyone to get off at, what is the destination uh, that this passage, and that's in a sense theme and aim. What is what is the main big thought that this is driving towards this passage, and where does it land? Uh, what Therefore, what is the purpose of this talk? Um, yeah. Once you've arrived at that kind of conception in your mind, then I, I, it's the same with writing, very much so. It's a matter of taking those really good sentences you've written that you really <laughs> like and and striking them out um, because they're they're not they don't actually get you there. They're on a different point or they're on a on a uh, a side track, a different line that would take you down somewhere else, which is fascinating and all very helpful. And you love them as sentences and you think they're a fan. <laughs> but they don't actually get you there. Yeah. And that's yeah. the case that oh, with sermons, it's obviously the case with illustrations. I mean, you really, you can you can tell a number of times I've listened to someone give an illustration and think, you really like this illustration, don't you? Like, <laughs> um, you love this, but it doesn't actually, and you just spent five minutes on it, but it, it's really only tangen tangential to, to where you're heading. And it wasn't needed to get me to the next point. Um, so whether it's the illustration you really love or whether it's the exegetical point that you want a little exegetical 
um, knot that you really want to untie and um, explain, but is not actually central to the to the message. Um, it's it is the matter of pairing it back to those things that that advance the whole argument forward. And, yeah, uh, I think I remember you saying you can. something along the lines: treat every sentence that you beloved that you birthed, <laughs> treat every of those beloved sentences as your enemy and force it to mm -hmm. prove to you why it have, gets to stay. Why does it actually just, deserve yeah, to exist yet? <laughs> what I've done just to get myself, um, to psych myself into doing that, because it's so hard for me to push delete, I have a space at the bottom of, of my document that I have a line and I put everything I take out uh, below the line because I can't get myself to delete it. So at least helps me get it out of the main point down there. <laughs> and eventually <laughs> after, right. after the gap, you say, I come back to it and I was like, yeah, that's, I'm just going to delete it. It's not as near as good as I thought it was when I first came up with it. Oh, um, absolutely. So that, no, don't delete yeah. it first off. Yeah, put it in a little separate file that's all my spare stuff, <laughs> all the extra bits that I might use. I might come back and use that, you say to yourself. Yeah, I there. hardly ever do. I never <laughs> do. The other thing that's been helpful over the years, I heard a little piece of advice from Chapo and John Chapman, who you would be able to tell me, uh, maybe I'm, I heard this wrong, but I, I was... It was helpful. So even if he didn't say it, it was helpful in how I'm saying it. But he said that, you know, in a seminary or kind of a master's degree lecture or Bible class, you can get through maybe 70, 80 percent of the details of the passage. Um, and maybe in a, a Bible talk, you know, a casual semi-formal Bible talk, you can get through 40 or 50 percent of the details and depth of the passage. But in a sermon or a talk given for general public consumption, you can only get through about 25, 30% of the details. Oh. And how we want to parse that out, for me at least, it's been helpful to think through. Yeah, my goal is not to give them download the exegetical analysis I, get, I learned myself in my study or some novel idea out there, but to get through the, the, the main theme and aim and the, the most important 25% that everyone needs to hear. That has served me very well over the years, as much as it's mm, anything has mm. served me. And um, maybe just lob that out there as some someone might find uh, I that could, helpful. Yeah, yeah, but thank you. That is very helpful, Marty, because you're right. We we have to do 100 percent in the study. We have yes. to we have to go through all the details and and understand the whole passage and and all the little ins and outs and the exegetical knots and have, have thought about them and worked our way to the point saying which ones are the sig really significant issues in in this one and which ones are ones that we that are interesting and valuable and had we time we dig into all of them but which are the ones we really need to explain and expound in order for the main message of this passage to to come forth. So, and, yeah, that's and really helpful. Back to a kind of a theological underpinning of this. It's the doctrine of God's sovereignty. I, I can't do it all in this 30 minutes. I won't yeah. do it all. Uh, I shouldn't try to do it all. Um, and it also leads into the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, that, I, that the Holy Spirit is with us and will lead us to the truth. Um, with the prayerful dependence upon the word. Um, and that's very comforting to me. It doesn't take away my, the necessary hard work and preparation, uh, but it does lead me to realize God's in charge and, and he will take care of his sheep. Um, so I appreciate your time, Tony, uh, talking us through this. And I, hopefully we get some something to take away, whether you're a preacher or someone who's just giving a talk or a little Bible presentation in front of people. Um, work hard. Give yourself some time. Uh, don't try to do everything. Come up with some really key points and stick with that. It sounds very basic and it's not very novel, but boy, I think it serves it served John Chapman well and it served thousands of preachers well over the years. And um, yeah, thanks for helping us in that, Tony. Not at all, Marty. Thanks for talking. <laughs>